There's so much upside to the people in the industry to teach and train them on broader retirement planning and broader solutions, not just how to sell a thing. Mm -hmm. Everything's been trained and taught what's the best way to sell a thing. And ultimately, I don't believe that's what people want or need. They want a solution approach. How do I add value to your life? Not make sure you can buy the thing I have to offer. Welcome to Business Ninjas. Brought to you by Right For Me, where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Business Ninjas. I'm here today with Ryan Ponsford, Senior Vice President of Equity Wealth Strategies at One Trust Home Loans. Ryan, how are you doing today? I am well, Andrew. Thanks for asking. How about yourself? I, I am good, thank you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I, I appreciate like you spending some time with us at Business Ninjas. Please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and about One Trust Home Loans. Sure, I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis, which I'll try and do a brief version. Um, I don't know how far back you want to go for myself. I could go to birth, or we could we can <laughs> evolve from there. You, I've got you know. You, you remember the details of your birth, right? <laughs> of not many of them. I've heard stories about them. I know my mom laughed out loud because I turned out to be the fourth boy, and I remember <laughs> she always wanted four boys, and I came out as a boy. And at last, I heard she laughed rather hysterically, and that about sums up my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> um, laughable moments after laughable moments, I guess, is a way to put it. Um, and a family that was uh, very well connected. Um, so I'll kind of walk you through my my journey and, and how I ended up where I ended up. Um, I, I grew up in Northern California, moved down to Southern California to go to college. Um, I went to Point Loma Nazarene University down here, originally a biology chemistry major with the intention oh. of being pre-med. Okay. Um, Want to be a doctor. Um, at that point, I had what might have been my only intelligent thought as about a 19, 20 year old, which was I loved the coursework. I loved everything I was doing, but I had this weird fear that acting in the medical profession today, I would be very much dictated by insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies as to what I couldn't and couldn't do. And I thought that would make me crazy. And it's funny now looking back in hindsight, I know that's not the case for everybody, but I know there is influence. And um, again, it might've been the only moderately intelligent thought I had at that age. But uh, so at the time, I, met, I loved psychology, um, ended up spent a lot of time there, and then I needed a job. I wanted to stay in San Diego, and I wanted to uh, do something so I could have my own place. And my roommate had gotten a job as a teller at Bank of America. I thought, well, heck, if Rob can be a teller, I can be a teller. It sounded like a, a really important job. And so I applied. And when I applied, I was interviewing and I'd had some sales experience selling Cutco knives. Yes. And I'll, I'll give a little Cutco plug. If, if anybody ever wants to be trained, it's probably the greatest sales training ever. And the knives are awesome. I still have my whole set, my Homemaker Plus 8, plus my hunting and fishing knives because I stacked it. You have a big day, you get a whole free set. Um, but I had some sales experience. So he asked me if I wanted to take a different job, which was slightly more flexible hours and paid a little bit better. And those sounded great to me. Um, so I said, yes. And at the time, they showed me a picture of an ATM machine and a telephone. And they said, this will be your office. I thought, well, that's a little bit strange, but <laughs> sounds good. I didn't know any different. And so it turns out I was one of the first guys in San Diego County that was hired to go walk up in the aisles of a supermarket. It was Lucky Supermarkets at the time and sell home loans, checking accounts, savings accounts and credit cards. And I didn't know that was kind of crazy. So I did it. Uh, they didn't have any training. They basically gave me a pile of brochures and a clipboard and an apron oh. and said, go sell stuff. And if I'd walk the aisles and if somebody said yes, I'd wait, take them to my little ATM kiosk, no branch, pick up the phone, press a button. There's a banker there that would take the application and the information. Wow. Okay. So unusual idea. Um, ended up having a ton of fun with it. I get all the PA announcements and I have a musical background. I play guitar in bands. I sing in quartets all over the US and Canada and, and Europe. And so I'd make up jingles and sing songs over the PA and had a lot of fun. Um, but it was one of the first things that I learned is the importance of creativity in the marketplace and the importance of psychology in the marketplace. And it made me realize that, you know, somebody that's there thinking about beans and cheese, getting them to think about home loans and credit cards was a mental transition. And so how you walk somebody through that became a study. 
And I started studying stores and demographics and the people that are there at 10 in the morning are very different than the people that are there at 5.30 or 6 at night. And so I uh, ended up building that program. Um, it expanded very rapidly. I ended up writing all the training for it and then traveling around California anytime we opened up a new store. And it was a really unique experience of the importance of just recognizing a need or an opportunity and figuring out a way to fill it. Um, I ended up moving from there into commercial banking. Um, went from commercial banking and then into private banking. And in the private banking world in, in banks, it's it's essentially a bank within the bank that works with the most qualified, most affluent clients. And so I spent quite a few years there and really learned a lot of the details of overall wealth management. Um, it's when Gramlich Blyley went through. So I ended up getting investment management license. So we were managing investments. We got kind of into the hedge fund alternative investment space. We we're also part of the trust committee, the trust department. So I ended up reading hundreds of trust documents in the process. So it was a really unique exposure to all things family and all things wealth. That is quite a trajectory. I mean, look, the word trust is in the name of your company and, and it's an important word. If you're walking up to a person in a supermarket and you're going from looking at cereal boxes to making decisions like loans and credit cards and banking, that's a serious leap of faith right there that in, that, that involves you know a, a human connection out of the gate or there's no way you can do business. So. You got invaluable, literally boots on the ground uh, sort of experience that's paying off down the road now. Very interesting trajectory, sir. And by the way, my oldest friend on earth, who I've known for fifty years, uh, worked for Cutco when we were teenagers, and I and and I remember right on looking through the sales book. And so, uh, no, they're they're teaching people the right way to approach human beings, which is a very important thing. What's the origin story of One Trust Home Loans? How long they've been in business? Great question. So. Um, I ended up in this kind of unique space and I, I'd left private banking. I built a, an investment management firm, an independent firm, um, grew that for quite a few years. And we really focused on families that had illiquid assets. So it was businesses, real estate, um, and then a lot on wealth transition. How do you transfer money to kids without them blowing the money and hating each other? Um, <laughs> which is a whole nother conversation we could probably do about seven episodes on. Um, and so, and, and, and you mentioned the whole idea of trust. How do you build trust? That, that's a whole nother topic. We can kind of rabbit hole down if we want, but, but it turns out that the primary owner of that company ended up getting sick and sold the company. And so I was kind of this point of trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. What was next? Had a handful of families I was still working with. Um, but I call, got a call from some friends of mine that I had known from the banking world that were really trying to address the issue of retirement planning mm -hmm. and the importance of lending and the significance of the wealth that have been created in real estate, specifically home equity. And if you look at most people in the retirement landscape today, they're moderately, if not underprepared for retirement from a financial standpoint. And about 70% or more of the average person's net worth is tied up in their home equity. We've had huge appreciation over the years, and there's been no effective way to, to integrate that into planning. And so these friends of mine called and said, hey, we think there's a thing here where um, home equity can play a role in retirement. I said, oh, it makes perfect sense. I've been you know, down that road quite a bit. I said, how are you going to do that? And I said, well, we think one of the cool tools is a reverse mortgage. So when that word came out of their mouth, I immediately threw up in my mouth and said, you're crazy. Absolutely not. That's a product that takes advantage of people. The kids lose the house and all these things I had believed. And they kept pushing back and challenging me, telling me I was wrong. Um, I didn't believe them because I don't believe anybody about much of anything. And then finally they said, well, can you just help us with something? And I said, okay, I'd like to help. What do you need? So can you do the math? I said, all right, I'll, I'm happy to do the math. I love doing math. In fact, in my planning practice, I was the guy that took client information. I built everything in an Excel workbook I'd built ran all my projections and then put it in the planning software just to make sure I was right. And because it made prettier pictures than I could make in Excel. So it made people think it looked nice, but ultimately I had to do the math myself. And so I ran the math and as much as I'd resisted the concept, once I did the math, I couldn't unsee it. It completely changed my perspective. And I realized if you guys are partly right, this thing could have a huge impact on creating better retirement outcomes. Yep. And I really ran it through the same lens I used in my planning practice, which was one, longevity. Can we extend the longevity of cash flow? Will your money last longer? Two would be lifestyle. Can we improve lifestyle? 
In theory, retirement should be the most meaningful part of our lives. So many of us save and put money away for this point, and then we get there. And if you don't have the financial resources, it's that's a bummer, right? You want to be able to do the things that you can do at that point in life. The third was liquidity. Do I have access to cash if I need it? And then the fourth was legacy. What do the kids end up with at the end? And when I ran it through those four lenses, I realized, wow, if you could integrate equity into the equation, you can actually improve most, if not all of those. And so I was pretty shocked. And so they said, you know, we think there's a thing. And I said, if you're partly right, there is a thing. Um, and at that point, I agreed to join them and help them solve this challenge. It was a different entity at the time. So they were with another reverse lender that only did reverse mortgage. And part of the way through that, we realized really what we needed to offer was broader home equity solutions, mm -hmm. not just a product pitch. Um, especially if we wanted to be able to work with advisors and other professionals, we needed to be solution driven, not product driven. And so after being there about five years, um, it was a, it was a good, great place to learn, great place to build what we were building. Um, but long-term, we just didn't see it as a good fit. And so, um, you know, we, it was, it was time to start looking for another platform. So we were all kind of looking independently, seeing what was out there. And one of the gentlemen ended up stumbling upon one trust, which is a full full mortgage lending platform. So they have full mortgage banking, they've done traditional lending, they do construction lending, they portfolio loan. So a very robust, solid platform and realize that could be a great place for providing what we wanted to provide. So that's kind of where this thing started. We all reached out to see who was doing what and this seemed to be the place that made the most sense. I have to say, I had a similarly shocking response to the details and fine print of reverse mortgages. As my parents brought the subject up, I thought, uh-oh, what snake oil salesman got them, got in front of them and was charming enough to talk them into this stuff until I looked at the realities of it. Yes, there are some people in the last 20 years that have been in the reverse mortgage business that are less than above board, but in general... What I see today is a very viable option for people um, that does cover all those bases. So I, I thank you for what you do. As a person with elderly parents, I thank you for what you do in that context. You just broached a little subject in terms of construction loans and things like that. What verticals do you service at, at One Trust? So what we ended up designing was a team that focuses on what we call 55 plus lending. Mm -hmm. It's essentially active adult lending meets retirement planning. And so we've tried to create solutions for people in that phase of life. My belief is we go through cycles in life and we have different needs based on where we are. And so we really wanted to address that decision-making point for people. As we transition from what I would call the accumulation phase of life, we're working, we're creating income and we're saving money to the distribution phase of life where we've created this pile of stuff. And we're now trying to figure out how do we convert this pile of stuff into enough income to cover our expenses. That's a transition period. Psychologically, people are going through different things. Kids are moved out or getting moved out. Grandkids are coming to the equation. We're starting to come to grips with mortality. Uh, we're realizing we've already, we're kind of at the end of our accumulation. Do we have enough? And so there's a lot of really significant decisions that are taking place that have a very long lasting impact. When you're accumulating, you can afford to make some mistakes. Once you get to where you are, you don't have as much time on your side. You don't necessarily have the ability to go back and drive more income. It gets far more difficult. And so each decision has far more impact than it previously did. And so how do we meet people at that point, at that decision-making crossroads of, I really got to get this right. And I want to do it with the right people that I can trust that are open-minded to all options and that will put my interest before their own. And so we designed this thing around hitting that target point. And we can offer, and what's interesting about lending over the years I've noticed is most people view lending as a single point at which you buy money essentially, right? I get money, I buy money from a bank. And there's nothing beyond that. Whereas what really becomes important and is often missed is the repayment of that money. And there's not enough focus on loan repayment. And there's a lot of strategic ways to repay debt, whether it's a auto loan, credit card loans, mortgages, whatever it might be, whatever type of debt or leverage you're using, there are strategies to how to manage it, how to repay it, how to mitigate risk associated with it. 
-hmm. and then the impact it has on all of your other assets, right? If you have retirement accounts and non-retirement accounts, how you take money out of those becomes really important, right? And the sequencing that you do it can have a tremendous impact on, again, the longevity of your cash flow, your access to liquidity, what the kids get at the end. And so there's just so many little nuanced decisions and the whole liability side of the balance sheet is left off. And so what we've tried to do is, is start creating solutions for people in that space. Now, we, we specialize in lending. And so what becomes important is to have partnerships with other professionals that can specialize in the asset management side. So, you know, who are the, the wealth managers out there? The insurance side, who are those people we can trust? Estate planning becomes a really big core part of this. How do we make sure that stuff's buttoned up and, and in good order for people? And so it's, it's really just beating people at this point of life and being able to provide solutions in partnership with their other advisors. So we have to be able to sit around the table and operate with the same level of intellect, the same level of skill set and experience and ultimately compassion that all those people would have for their clients in order to earn a seat at the table to provide solutions, not just be a, a product pitch at the end of it. Excellent. I, I love it. I think I already know the answer to the question, but what differentiates you from your competitors? What makes you stand out in the market today? You know, that's a great question. Um, the The reverse mortgage industry is, a, is actually a very tiny, tiny, small industry. Um, and it's not because the demand or the need isn't there. It just simply, I, my person, I'm, I'm going to be biased and I'm going to apologize to everybody in the reverse mortgage industry as I slowly dismantle it. But I think the industry in general has done a very poor job of marketing and describing what this thing can do for families in a strategic manner. It's been very much pitched as the last resort. You screwed everything up. You made mistakes and here's your bailout. And that's just not true. I mean, it can be used for that, but that is, that's maybe 10% of the cases. The other 90% are not being talked about and not being addressed, right? So there's a big gap there. And the other thing is the industry has not invested, in my opinion, very well in its people. There's so much upside to the people in the industry to teach and train them on broader retirement planning and broader solutions, not just how to sell a thing. Mm -hmm. Everything's been trained and taught what's the best way to sell a thing. And ultimately, I don't believe that's what people want or need. They want a solution approach. How do I add value to your life? not make sure you can buy the thing I have to offer. And so what we've tried to do is design this team in a different way, where A, we're solution-based, and B, we've learned that we can really connect better with people by partnering with their other advisors and their other professionals in their lives. And so our team is very much committed to how do we become the most qualified team to partner with financial professionals. How do we make sure they have access to the tools, resource, and education they need to present this intelligently to their clients? Because we can go tell somebody all day this thing is great and they should do it, but this industry lacks the credibility, in my opinion, to get them to understand that or even listen to it. Whereas the financial services industry has credibility, and so, but they're they have no idea how this thing works. We've done it horrible job of explaining to the financial professionals how this thing works. So most of them are in the dark. We've come a long ways in the last, I'll call it three to five years. There's academics out there now producing a lot of content that this thing's starting to make sense. But ultimately, it's it's there's still a tremendous gap. And so that's the space we're really focused on is going to the professionals, getting them up to speed so that we can partner with them on changing the message, changing the opportunity, and changing the profile of the people that could benefit from this. Well, it leads into another question of mine. You broached the word content. Uh, you know, you got to tell your story. You have to engage and educate people. I mean, frankly, I agree. Your industry has not done a great job of explaining the possibilities with reverse mortgages. Most of us think of it as a late night infomercial with a, a star from the 80s or somebody else who comes out and you're not quite sure what you're being presented with. So what role has content played in the growth of one trust home loans? Uh, not enough. I mean, it's, it's, I think that's where the future is and that's a place we need to go to. We've kind of put a stake in the ground just in the last six, eight months of if we really want to move, that's the place we have to get to. Um, there's, you know, there's a whole industry around content and there's so much formulaic upside to doing it correctly. 
Um, but it's, you know, it's having the right partners, the right people that can help you do it. Um, it's not, it's, it's, it's a simple, not easy, right? It sounds simple, but execution becomes the whole key to it. And the challenge in reverse is because so few people know about it, there's very little public content that you can repurpose. So you almost have to create a lot of the content. And so for us, it's been a matter of, okay, we, we've, we built this platform, we've got it stood up, now we're making progress, and we're only a year into this with our team, and we've gone, by the way, from startup to a top 15 lender in the space, one of the fastest growing ever in the space, which is pretty cool, um, although I always, we, we joke that, you know, that makes us basically the small, the tallest man in the room full of midgets, um, <laughs> if I'm allowed to say that, but um, so, so we've made great progress, and now really it's a matter of sitting down and us starting to craft content and getting this the new language, the new messaging, the new opportunity out. So I think that has to be done. Um, we'll do as much of it we can. I still wonder why there's not a better partnership within the reverse mortgage industry to do a better job of promoting this stuff. Um, I think that's a massive miss right now that we can't come together and do something, but there's it's, it's funny that there's just so much competition around this small little slice of people that get served. None of them play well in the sandbox together. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of ground to be covered, I think, on that front as well. I think it's doable. Um, most things are once we can, you know, if you can get the right people in the right seats at the right time. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to keep going down that path. Well, hey, it, this harkens back to your days in the cereal aisle. It Everything cannot be transactional. You have to build a relationship and trust and you have to educate people. And if it's a solution and it works for them, fabulous. But when you're laser focused on just the transaction at hand, people don't end up building that relationship and that trust. And, and if your industry as a whole is missing that point, that's kind of odd to me because there's a lot of business in this country to be had through reverse mortgages. I mean, it, it, it is a viable solution. Again, as I put on my glasses and I read the fine print more and more, it is not what I think most people have the perception of. And, and the messaging is important. It has to be done. Um, switch gears to the last couple of years. You know, it's been the double-edged sword, I'm sure, for your industry. COVID created um, a lot of movement. People, you know, the, the great resignation, finding new jobs, new places to live. So there's a lot of transaction going on. But as interest rates go further and further up, that creates other challenges. Tell me how you've managed to grow your business through the COVID years? Yeah, that's a great question. I would, I would say COVID in itself, you know, it's, it's funny when you ask people about this COVID and this pandemic, some people have very diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, I was with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago chatting about it. And, you know, for him, it was a big challenge. His kids have had real challenge with it because they're so isolated. Um, it was funny. I asked, I asked my kids about it and they said it was the, the most fun couple of years of their lives because, you know, school was shut down. They're doing online education, which was sort of a joke. We got mountain bikes and, you know, rode all over the place. we got great trails outside my house. So um, for us, I, I, I started coining the theme. I, I got my guitar, dusted it off, rewrote some songs and just, and had a fun time with it. Um, so we had a theme, which was don't ever waste a good pandemic. <laughs> and so there was a point in it where I was, you know, I was sort of realized <laughs> this thing's going to come to an end and we're going to have to get back and, you know, and be grownups again, whereas, and, and go back to normal, whatever that might be. Um, and, and that's not to undermine, you know, lives were lost and terrible things happen. And I, I don't want to downplay that because that's real. Um, but sometimes it is perspective. And so some of the upside things with that is, you know, technology became a thing. We're sitting here on Zoom having a conversation, which is now very mainstream. And we're, we're living in, you know, George Jetson world right now. And it accelerated a lot of that. I used to have to get on a plane to go meet people on a regular basis, whereas, you know, we might have been okay with Zoom in the in a corporate environment. We used it because we we're spread all over the country. But now you have clients in this case used to it, and a lot of people in our industry, because we're dealing with a, a more senior demographic, there's this perception that oh, none of them use Zoom, none of them use text or email, and I just haven't found that to be true. I mean, I do a ton of conversations because everybody accelerated the the need to learn. You know, it's that necessity is the mother of all invention, right? And and so now more and more people can sit and have this conversation. So for us, accelerated a lot of our ability to do business with that demographic because it became easier for them and they were more accustomed to working in this manner. So a lot of efficiencies got created through that time period. Now, you also mentioned interest rates. You know, that's a whole different conundrum, right? So we're in, you know, 20-year worst mortgage market you've probably ever seen, but certainly, you know, for the most part in my life now, 
I was in banking when we saw rates get into the nines and that was exciting. We started this refi boom when I was in the private bank and then they got into the nines. And then I remember getting to refi a loan at seven and three quarters and we're high five in each other. And that went on for years. Right. And so, you know, it's not unheard of that we're in this interest rate environment, but it's not what we're accustomed to. What's interesting with the reverse mortgage space is it's a little bit different from an interest rate perspective. Because you don't typically do reverse mortgage for rate and term, okay. right? You do reverse mortgage because of all the other things it does. And so you do it because it creates a few things. One is complete cash flow optionality. With a reverse mortgage, I have the option of either making zero payments. I can pay interest only payments. I can pay principal and interest. I can pay it off. And if I pay it off, I can turn and drop back the next week or whatever I want to do. So it creates a huge amount of flexibility for how I manage my cash flow. Other loans don't do that, right? The other really interesting thing that most people don't realize about the reverse loan is most of the time you're structuring that as a revolving line of credit. So it almost operates like a home equity line of credit. So it's attached to your home and the amount of equity you can get is based on the value of your home. And so when you get that line of credit, it's revolving, meaning you can pay in, draw out, whatever you want to do, mm -hmm. a ton of flexibility. What most people don't realize is the amount of equity you have available to your total equity line actually increases every single month. And most people don't know that. So if I get a you know $300,000 equity line and my all-in interest rate is call it 5%, I might owe $100,000 on that line. Let's say I paid off my old mortgage and I owe $100,000 on that line and my all-in rate's 5%. The rate's a little higher than that now, but I'll use that because it's easy math for my little brain. So at $100,000, if I never make a payment, at the end of that year, I'll owe roughly $105,000, right? 5% 5 on 100, a little over 105 because it compounds monthly, sure. right? At the same time, if my total credit line was... 300,000, the amount I could lend you is $300,000. That same all in rate, that 5% in this example, will also be credited to the total credit line. So my 300,000 at the end of the year will grow to roughly 315, right? A little more because it compounds monthly. And so a lot of people don't realize that simple nuance that those lines spread. So even if you have no mortgage and you put this in place, you're going to have that compounding growth of that credit line that if you do this young can become a very significant access to future liquidity down the road when you really need it. So in that example, higher interest rates can actually really benefit you as you're calculating the growth on that line of credit. So it's a really interesting kind of backward way to look at it, but it kind of elevates the point that to do a reverse mortgage, you really have to think about all the nuances of it. You know, example now, three years ago, these things were, you know, 2%, 2.5%. And, you know, it didn't really make sense to make payments on them. And you don't have to, so why bother? You know, now if we're at 7 7.5%, we might re look at this and say, okay, if you've got an option, again, it's what do you do with the extra dollar? Am I investing it? Or am I paying down my line? We might go to people and say, you know what, in today's market, let's actually make payments on that line. Maybe it's interest only or whatever your free cash flow is. Let's pay it down. That now secure lowers your debt expense by call it 7%, whatever the number is. And so you're getting essentially a 7% return on that by not paying the debt, right? Just looking at the other side of the balance sheet. And then if you need it next month, you can always drop back. So it changes the use of this back to the concept of the art of repayment of loans. And so reverse mortgage definitely falls into that category of being intentional and strategic around how you pay the loan, not just how you get the money. Hey, it's fascinating. I know some people might think we need to get our pocket protectors out, but I find it fascinating. And it's important, <laughs> it's important, it's important information. People need to understand what's available to them. And again, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree that your industry has not collectively done a great job of making this a viable option to people. It is, it is presented almost as a last resort that those guys over there will sell you if, if the normal avenues of, uh, of finance don't work for you. So I applaud yeah. your approach. You, you got to educate the people and people appreciate value, which is what that education is. And uh, like I said, 
Cutco taught you well back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to say, you know, people ultimately just need to be informed. You yeah. know, can you can you help people make informed decisions? Is it right for everybody? Of course, not nothing is, right? There's no, there's there's so many financial products, instruments out there and the, you, you get the talking heads that will say, oh, never do this or always. And, you know, every single person is different, right? The only thing I can tell you is your situation is different. The mine is different than, you know, the people next to us at the conference, right? Whatever it might be, Everybody has their a unique situation, a unique tolerance for what they're going to do, you know, unique money experiences in life that inform so many of their decisions. And it's, you know, how you grew up and your perception of money as a child will impact your decisions that you make today. And so everybody, you have to take that into account when you're trying to provide them good counsel, good advice, but ultimately you want people to make informed decisions, right? What they do is on them. Um, but how do we provide them with resources to make what what is the best decision for them in that particular circumstance? Excellent. All right. L look down the road a year in the future. What are some things you'd like to be celebrating personally and professionally? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, oh, man, I could go down a lot of angles on that one. Um, I'm a for what we're doing with the firm, with with one trust. Uh, like I said, we're building this. Um, you know, we have a a objective of making this a mainstream retirement product tool solution. And it's funny when you look at the marketplace for this industry, I can look at total number of people in the senior demographic um, cut out by non-homeowners cut out. And, you know, if I start whacking down to people, I believe are age and equity qualified that would likely benefit from including this type of a strategy. Um, I come up with the numbers somewhere around 30 million people that I think could benefit from doing this, okay? Our industry as a whole, historically, there have been ups and downs, does about 50,000 units in a year <laughs> in a roughly 30 million marketplace. So that's about one eighth of 1%, right? A little more plus or minus a bit, about an eighth of percent. If we go to one half of 1% of market capture, you know, we're at like 200,000 of these things. So as a firm, you know, our plan, our design, if I were to look back and say, where are we, it would be to have established ourselves as the primary resource for professionals, advisors, attorneys, CPAs to help validate and run the math. Is this the right thing for people and have integrated into their practice to where this has become a mainstream part of something we must look at for people? Right. We need to at least evaluate the option. We're designing tools like that for professionals right now of just, hey, help us run and illustrate what this might look like. What impact does this have long term? And I would view our team as probably one of the more qualified teams to be able to support financial institutions and professionals in that space. Um, you know, we're new and this comes back to your content question. Right. How do we become that? You know, so much of that comes down to how do we become known? And we used to say, do we do we want customers or do we want followers? And in some ways in this space, we almost need to focus on followers. We need to be leadership of thought and innovation in this space. And I think we do that and, you know, customers will follow. And so we've really tried to think through that of how do we start creating this followership to lead this industry into what I believe is the next iteration of this as a legitimate, sophisticated, intelligent way to consider retirement planning. Um, so that's a, that's maybe a, I don't know if that's a wild, crazy oh, thing, no, but you're, it's a, You're talking about building plan. that uh, field of retirement dreams, uh, you know. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yes. Well, please tell us what's your URL. Where can people find uh, One Trust Home Loans and what social media outlets are you using these days as well? Great question. So onetrusthomeloans.com is the is the core website for the for the mortgage company. So they can certainly find us there. Um, you can Google search us. Uh, we're actually in the process of building a, a page specific to our equity wealth strategies team. So that's soon to be launched. And we're actually, we just had a full discussion this week on the right URL and, and how do we drive people to it. Uh, we're just starting to get in the content space. So there's a lot of that we're working on, which you know we may kick around with you. I know this is an area you know a lot about. Um, and so, uh, just a little smidger. Um, so there's a bunch for us to do in that space. So again, we're pretty early on in, in getting a lot of that information out. Um, you know, the other thing we do a lot of work on is, and it's, it's 
related, not related, is we do a lot of speaking at conferences and things. And, and a lot of that is more around um, things I've built over the years in previous firms around how do you build better relationships? How do you accelerate trust? Uh, I do a lot of work in the giving and philanthropic space. And so there's a lot of work that that gets done in that side of the thing, which is probably more of a personal side thing that I do that I just really enjoy. Um, you know, I happen to think that giving is the answer to a lot of the problems we face in the world. Um, we seem to be in an increasingly divided world. And that's, again, there's probably eight more podcasts we could do on that whole con that whole concept. But I think giving might be the anecdote to a lot of that. And so we're simultaneously teaching, promoting the importance of of giving in the process of being good partners. And, you know, we, we teach our loan officers and other people this, this kind of sequence of learn, serve, grow, um, learn about people, get to know them, serve them in some capacity. And I think it starts bringing connection back to the world, which I think is a, is a big missing link. So I think you'll see more of that information and content coming out from me personally, and just from the work we're doing. And that's a, that's a big, but if I go the 12 months out of, of a look back that that whole side of, the communication and the messaging, I think, would be integrated into all of this. Brian Ponsford of, of One Trust Home Loans, a distinct pleasure to have you today on uh, Business Ninjas. Appreciate you. All the best to you and yours and continued success at One Trust Home Loans. Andrew, appreciate you. You're a true ninja and uh, <laughs> more to come, I'm sure. So thank you again for your time. It's been absolute pleasure here to hang out with you. My pleasure. Be well.